times I have to go out by myself and be alone. And I find myself in the woods a lot. And I get that good feeling when I'm in, in the woods. It's like I know everything and I, I can feel the ground, I can feel, feel the bush. And it's, it's great, you know. I think that's one reason why I survived in Nam is that being of an American Indian, being close to nature, it's like I could ask the ground when I was on patrols or something. Take care of me, or ask the tree, show me where's my enemy, or ask the animals, watch over me, be my guide. And a lot of times it worked. They warned me why the enemy was around. And at night I'd ask the crickets, or the little, little, little four-legged creatures, and the winged creatures, insects. Brothers, you know, be my eyes for me tonight. And it, it worked. So a lot of my Indian is carried when I was in Nam. And most of my relatives have fought in wars. Most of my uncles have fought in them. From uh, the Civil War to the Cherokee Wars, there have always been warriors in my family. I have a, he's a second cousin to my mother, so it makes me a third cousin. In World War II, his name is Jack Montgomery. He won the Medal of Honor in Italy. I believe that's what it was, either Italy or Germany. He was awarded the Medal of Honor. And I always looked at that picture of him in uh, Roosevelt. And I thought that's a pretty, you know, that was a really great honor, the Medal of Honor. Mm -hmm. I thought that was really something. The strong sense of duty and honor of the American Indian soldier is dramatically demonstrated by the high proportion of service by volunteers. Nearly 20% of the Indian population are veterans. Of the 81,000 Vietnam-era Indian veterans, 42,000 served in Vietnam. The motivation to serve has its roots in generations of family and tribal traditions. What motivates them? What special experience from their heritage go with them into battle? Is there a magic that protects them? This program will look at the American Indian veteran, what he is and isn't. It will also explore resources available to all VA clinicians and counselors who are involved in treatment programs with American Indian veterans. As combat veterans, they suffer many of the same problems as their non-Indian counterparts. The difference is in the avenues of support available to the Indian veterans, support that rises out of a culture and a heritage as a warrior. Members of my family on the Tewa side, on my dad's side, were uh, a warrior, a warrior farmer group. The the Tewas were known for their fighting ability in the southwest uh, of the Pueblo groups, and we were historically some of the first groups to uh, lead the Pueblo rebellion, along with the uh, the uh, man who was whipped, Ope. A. So it's kind of a, a family type of thing. And as a as a baby, my grandfather, my great grandfather, had blessed me as one of during the Second World War when I, I was born that he came up when I was just a, a baby yet and he picked me up and blessed me as, as the old men would do that my life was to be a warrior and he did this by saying prayers and then putting a feather and then taking what they call his spit and rubbing it on me saying this man is going to be when he grows up will be the warrior in our family so my mom was very upset with that that I was chosen out of my brothers and sisters to become a warrior. I'm a street street Indian, and I grew up in uh, an atmosphere where there were gangs. When I was younger, I was in gangs, and I had encountered death. Uh, I was a survivor. Uh, that's where I grew up. I grew up uh, among many cultures, uh, the black culture, the Spanish culture, Mexican culture, uh, Anglo culture, and uh, the urban Indian culture, street Indian culture. Uh, I mixed with the traditional Indian, so uh, I was uh, gifted in a number of ways uh, as far as survival. In back, back in my time when I was a young boy, uh, when I went into the service in World War II, my grandpa put a big celebration on for me and he had a big giveaway. He told the people that I was going off to war. And at that time, he also gave me an Indian name. 
he gave me the name of Standing Bear. Then he also made a song for me that they sang at that celebration. And when I come back, well, they had another celebration for me and a big feast. And, that, and the people were happy that I came back in one, one piece. It's automatically assumed, I think, in many cases, that, that Indian people, you know, if they enter the military service and they have uh, throughout the years in great numbers, that this implies a, uh, a loyalty or a meaning uh, or a loyalty to the United States government and, uh, and to the United States. I think that in many cases what Indians go into the military service for, uh, it, well, they give military service a different kind of meaning. Uh, you'll see older, uh, older Indian people, uh, say, standing in front of the flag, what they're not, they're not necessarily going into a kind of allegiance to the United States flag or something, but they're drawing power from it. Uh, I think that over the years, what, what has happened is that, is that uh, Indian people have, uh, through various tribes, uh, have built up a, a sort of tradition of going into the military service. Um, in World War One, I've talked to World War One Indian veterans, and they saw going into the military as, as a kind of a fulfillment of treaty obligations, uh, where they were allied with the United States, uh, and that therefore, if you go to war against Germany, you, uh, or some, or something like that, you were you were fulfilling that treaty obligation. Uh, also, there's a there's a fact they. They'll say often enough that that. Um, that we go in the military service to protect our country. And that isn't actually a reference to the United States as it's a reference to Sioux land or Navajo land or, uh, or Cherokee land or whatever. My father was, you've got to serve your country, you might as well do it now. Why wait till later? Because I hate to be, you don't want to be drafted. There's never been a draftee in my family. <laughs> And I think it's, that'd be a slur to the family if it was a draftee. No, there are no draftees in my family. Members of my family had served in some capacity or another during either the Second World War, the First World War, Second, and the uh, Korean conflict. Uh, Korean War, rather, it's not so much a conflict, but a war. And my brother-in-law, who was a paratrooper with the uh, 187th Regimental Combat Team, used to talk about different things and a lot of the people on the reservation were were veterans and uh, also you know talking about different things that were happening particularly militarily that that I would sooner as I got older that was part of my obligation to to uh, enter the service. Sometimes there's a stereotypic view of how Indians view war. I think it's important to realize we're talking about three to four hundred different tribes and cultures but if you had to get into some kind of shorthand, you'd say there's two main ways of looking at it. One as war as a, a way of demonstrating one's courage, one's manhood, one's attainment of a position of honor. Another way looks upon war as a total aberration in the law of the universe, a complete breakdown of order, and as such a thing to be avoided at all costs. It's interesting that even with those two totally divergent views, there couldn't be two views that were more different about war. Both of the cultures that subscribe to those views still come to the same conclusion, and that is you have to prepare the individual to go out into it, and then you have to bring them back in a very special sort of way. You don't ask in either of those cultures that the warrior forget what they have been through. Nobody does that. Nobody tries to do that. You acknowledge what they have been through, and you recognize what they've been through, and you recognize the individual. The warrior has to begin today, uh, as he comes home, is to begin to purify himself. And that's going to take maybe a year, or two years, three years. Maybe some will take longer, because 
War is ugly, and it leaves a lot of scars. And I think some of the boys, it's going to take a lot longer in that sweat lodge and pray. So these things will, will leave them. And eventually, they'll become, they'll become a true warrior to their people, to be a good example to the young people, which is something we don't have today. Is we don't have very many good examples for our young people to look at and say, I'd like to be like him. We don't have that. And that's where the warrior is going to play a big part. The importance of the family, the community, or the extended family is a key element in tribal culture. It provides stability and the full support of the society. The warrior's role is an important one and related to the whole community. Tribal customs and medicine help prepare the warrior for battle and bring him back into the community after service. Later, he is called upon for his wisdom as an advisor and teacher based on his experience as a warrior. Well, the definition of tribe is one of kinship, based on kinship lines. Um, and that may or may not necessarily be blood ties. For example, how people relate to each other, um, the roles that people have. A good example would be a child growing up, being raised not only by the mother and the father, but by aunts and uncles and grandparents. Um, an example child may have many grandparents, may have many aunts and many uncles, and they may not necessarily be blood. They may be friends, they may be other people in the community, but because the child relates to them the way they would to an aunt, an uncle, a grandmother, a mother, a father, or a cousin, they're considered part of the kinship group. So it's like an extended family, only it extends way out beyond blood ties. It, it, it's much more a community type feeling than what we think of when we talk about the extended family in contemporary American culture, which usually includes the grandparents, maybe aunts and uncles. This goes way beyond that. The family occupies a very important position in this whole thing. Rather than treat the warrior as an isolated individual, he's being supported from both the people who are older than him and the people who are younger than him, in both directions, if you will, and being acknowledged by everybody that he has contributed something of value, something of substance, something that was necessary. And this is more than just simply acknowledging it. This isn't just a pat on the head and saying, well, you went off and you did a nice job, and let's now go on to business. The family itself is taking on the burden and the experience that the warrior had. Well, there's a continuity of from one generation to another. There's, there's not the so-called generation gap, but a passing of knowledge from one generation to the next and an understanding of where people come from way back in the tribal history, way, way back in the kinship history, and extending forward to future generations to come, that people will pass on their knowledge and pass on the value of, of that kinship group. There's a teaching forward and an understanding from past generations of the values and the practices. Uh, what we're trying to do is, through the tribal school, is try to, try to pass some of these things on. But in the past, uh, everything was done within the Teoshpa. That's where all the, the children, the grandchildren, uh, the adopted children, everybody was educated within that Teoshpa. But now we're in, we're in different times, and it's, you don't, uh, you don't uh, have these Teoshpas anymore, so we're going to have to go to a, a different system to do it. Probably uh, like films, uh, the tribal school will be able to uh, teach them many things there, but we won't be able to teach them everything. But we'll be able to teach them enough so that they'll have a, have a good identity of themselves. At least they're going to know where their roots are, you know. They're not going to have the emotional problems that they have today, not knowing, you know, where they, where they came from, who they are. You know, and that's very important to any child is to know who he is and where he's from. You know. He's got to have a past that he can relate to. The warrior returns. 
Whether the Indian combat veterans saw the war as honorable or as a great aberration in the law, the effect of combat was the same. War was, for all of them, a shock that reached to the roots of who and what they were. I, uh, I still have a hard time, kind of. Trying to, uh, trying to just let things ride, but I think the hardest time I had over there is not being able to come home to one time in particular. My grandfather died. My grandfather blessed me before I went over. And I found out that he died and I was honoring him by being in that war too, but I couldn't come home. Then I had a man who I liked very much. He was a good friend. His name of Manuel Barreras. He was married to an Indian woman, and his wife, and he had children. And he got killed. The sad thing about it was that he had a baby who was, his wife had a baby. Never even had a picture of him because he was going to go home and see that child. He said, in real, real life. He never made it. And I had to pick him up. Because at that time, he walked point for me. And we got ambushed. I'd rather not. November... 20th of 1968, we went out on an ambush. We killed who we had to kill. The only mistake we made was in his battalion area. We were 50 feet from his bunker. We killed all the executive, all the, all of his higher echelon soldiers. We took all of his information. I lost. I said my best friend, Terry Clifton. And I lost 11 other men. And I was left for 12 hours by the government. And they're trying to make up their mind whether to come get me or not. For 12 hours, I didn't think I could kill anymore. And I, kill, I was so tired of killing, I was sick of it. I was sick because they were coming, they kept coming. Well, I think there's a myth that floats around that Number one, all Indians have warrior societies in their tribes, and they were all the Indian warrior on his painted pony with his eagle feather war bonnet riding off to war, and the stoic Indian. And, and there's an idea that people from tribal cultures are immune to post-traumatic stress disorder, but the very definition of post-traumatic stress disorder is going through a psychic trauma that will cause that type of response and symptoms in almost anyone. And Indians are human, and when they go through a psychic trauma, such as combat, um, it's going to affect them just the way it would any other person. And one of my nephews came up from behind me one day and stuck this toy M14 at me. And all I, all I remember seeing, you know, he was creeping up on me, and I was sitting there, and he came up. And all I remember seeing was a shadow in that, that barrel, and I reached down and I grabbed him, and I, I almost killed my nephew. I was gonna smash him. I missed him with the, right, with the rifle, but it's just a natural reaction, just like that. And my sister, if my sister hadn't come in and yelled at me, I think I might've hurt him, you know. And she told me, she said, damn, you're crazy. She said, you, that war made you crazy. And I thought, I must be crazy. So for a long time there, I, I felt real bad. It's very important to understand that the giving of the medicine bag or the ceremony or whatever before the veteran leaves and the welcoming back ceremony may help facilitate readjustment. They do not stop the person from getting post-traumatic stress disorder, from getting PTSD. If a person goes through psychic trauma, it doesn't really matter what culture they're from. 
In fact, the whole reason for things like the enemy way is because it was understood that a person who goes through that kind of trauma will have these types of problems. And this is how we can help this person readjust back from these types of problems. You know, if, you're, if you could be sitting here talking and all of a sudden the TV, like a TV comes on in your head and you re-envision it, you know, like watching the movie, a Sam Peck and Bob movie, and you see all this blood and gore and you can't get it out of your mind. You don't want to die over here because you're back over here, but you feel like you're going to die. It makes you sweat. It makes you taste again. It makes you feel everything you felt the first time. And you, yeah, you smell it, you taste it. You smell cordite, you smell gunpowder. You smell blood, you smell intestines. It's everything you see, you smell and you can touch it again. I have flashbacks. I had times of depression. I, like I said, other than my wife and a few selected friends that I'm beginning to make, there are very few people in this world I trust. And when you can't trust people in the world, you're in big trouble. And I went out and bought me a pistol. And I was so angry and I said, the damn war fucked me up. I took the pistol and stuck it in my mouth. I was going to kill myself. So nobody gives a shit about me. Nobody cares about me. My family's calling me crazy. Damn people don't respect me. I have nothing to come home to. What the hell am I doing here? Then I remembered my, my grandmother. My grandfather said, anytime things get rough with you, just get away by yourself and pray. So I remembered that, and I was sitting there crying, and I started praying. And they, they taught me some names, some sacred names to call on. So I said, ah, that's what I'll do. Well, so I threw that gun away. I didn't throw it away, but I got rid of it. I said, if I'm going to attack this problem, I'm going to have to attack it right, see what I can do. As far as my relatives and my home communities are concerned, they, they accepted me. I didn't volunteer to go over to Vietnam. I was drafted. I was forced to go. I went in. I served it. Came back. And my relatives, my immediate family, they accepted me. And they noticed that I started experiencing a lot of social problem. I wasn't the same. I didn't really realize I have changed it that much. That's when they started talking about the enemy way ceremony. And enemy way ceremony is a, a seven day ceremony. It's a ceremony which allows you to readjust back into society. I didn't believe, completely believe in the ceremony, but I went through it. It, it did purify me. It's real. It's not something that that is a symbolic, I found that it's, it's, it's real. But the main thrust is to bring them back into the, into the tribe, to let them know that it's over, and to let them know, too, that everybody else shares that burden. So, for example, if we were watching uh, Hopi, who have a general view of the universe that would require viewing war as a major disruption of the law, in capital letters, we would see them bringing their warriors back in with an idea towards cleansing them of the taint of the contamination that they picked up, just in the same way that we might have people do an unwelcome job like cleaning out a uh, broken nuclear reactor. They come out, we'll give them a monetary bonus and praise and all that, and then we're going to decontaminate them before they can come back in. They're not lesser people. They've done a necessary job, but a job that might have hurt them if we don't go about the business of cleansing. For an enemy way ceremony to happen, it takes the whole community, the immediate family. There's a lot of money involved, gift given. It's a seven day ceremony. There's a lot of preparation. The last three days of the ceremony is when it's most busy. There's several medicine men involved. It takes a lot of work. There's a lot of fasting. A uh, certain type of food that you have to eat. There's a lot of herb gathering. 
it's a, a tedious ceremony. It's very tiresome. Uh, there's a lot of songs involved, prayers. Uh, I personally feel it's it's a really good outlet. It's something that the Navajo people still uh, have. They have retained it, many of their uh, culture, their religion, you know, through that ceremony. I felt that, you know, that it's a good thing that we still have it. Every summer we still have it. There's a number of veterans still going through it. There's a number of veterans that has gone through that ceremony twice. There's a number of uh, veterans that has really gained it from that ceremony. It's recognized by many of the doctors in, in our home communities, white Indian doctors, and I just hope we perpetuate the ceremony in some way. The ceremonies are kept alive at powwows held around the country. The dances, the songs, the drums, all to honor the returning warrior. I, c I came to this year's powwow mainly because I felt a personal interest. I felt that I was honoring, honoring myself the Indian tribes around the country, my tribe, the Navajo Nation, and those that have gave their lives. I lost two cousins in Vietnam. I lost a brother while he was on active duty. I lost some real close relatives. I thought about them when I was out there. I was very serious. I didn't joke around. I just felt that I should honor them. And those songs, you know, really did had some special meaning for me. I felt tears in my eyes several times, thinking of my cousin. And I just wish, you know, they were here to participate. So these power really do mean a lot to me. I, I feel that I'm here representing my tribe uh, the Indian around the country, and also veterans in general, the blacks, the whites, Mexican Americans, all those veterans that have served, I think that we're also honoring them. So it gives me special pride, you know, to go step out there, hold a feather. It really does give me pride, you know, I show that honor to myself and also to the veterans and, uh, and our country in general. I had no idea what a powwow was before I went. Uh, as, as much as I had read about Indians and spoken in my family and, and this sort of thing. And uh, uh, I went down to this conference and it was a three-day conference and the powwow, I believe, was the, the night of the second day. And the, and the first day there were a series of lectures and, and we talked about post-traumatic stress and all these different things. And uh, there was not a lot of patience among the participants for that sort of of dialogue. It, was, it wasn't that it was uh, uh, irrelevant, it was just that that, that wasn't the way that, that, that they were going to relate emotionally to this gathering. Uh, and they kept telling me, wait till the dancing starts. And it really was one of the most profound things I've ever experienced. The first one that they had, when 48 uh, tribes were represented from around the country uh, to come in and for the first time in the intertribal association context honor those who had served in Vietnam. Uh, when they went out uh, for the, the special dance for the veterans in the, in the first powwow, it really was one of the most powerful experiences I, I've, I've ever seen. Uh, uh, they started one at a time. They came in with the, the uh, the, the fancy dancers, the, the people who were dressed up and had, they had M16s, and then the people who were Vietnam veterans were, were allowed to, to fall behind them, and then others fell behind the, the Vietnam veterans. I was allowed to, to go out and dance because I was a Vietnam veteran, and sort of snaked until they were in a circle, then they turned to the drum, and they started screaming, and the guys were crying. And there was one guy who was standing next to me who'd been with the 1st Air Cavalry. And, and imagine the paradox. Uh, someone from a white culture looking at an individual who's got a blanket on, but half of it honors the Mexicans that they fought, who they fear very strongly 
about. Half of it honors the cavalry that they fought in history with a first air cav Custer's own patch on it in the back. Uh, the, the, the combination of that is, is, is paradoxical. And yet, this guy was a big man, was, was standing there, and uh, the, the room was so filled with emotion. And his wife walked up behind him and put her hands on his back. And as soon as she touched him like that, he cried. What we're seeing is the integration of people back into their culture. We're also seeing, if you've been watching the powwow and seeing the children, we're seeing the beginning of a contract, if you will, between some people and each other that says from a very early age, if you, go, if you have to go off and do things like become a warrior, we'll be here to support you. The young children that we saw dancing were being, in effect, taught that look around you, you see these warriors. If you have to be one, we will be here to not only support you, but bring you back in. And that's an important message for people to get at the very beginning. I think we, I uh, decided to go back to my roots. The powwows, they uh, give me peace of mind. They make me feel not as, as, I said, white people look at me. I said, I'm a, I'm a killer, I'm dirt. The Indians don't treat me like I'm dirt. It embarrasses me when they honor me because I'm just like anyone else, even though I have all these awards they gave me. That doesn't make me any different. The only thing is, is they honor me because I have them. And I'm not treated like a killer, even though, you know, I did, I had to perform, and that was my job was to, as an infantryman, was to kill the enemy. But to see this, I get my peace of mind back. I get tranquility. I'm within peace within myself. Notice that, um, that uh, the, the more dan dancers that you get, the more it comes into a circle. Uh, what, what uh, the circle has always kind of symbolic meaning. There's power in a circle, it shows continuity. Uh, it's uh, uh, a, and, and you also notice in the gore dance that, that all the warriors uh, face the drum, uh, and technically no one's supposed to get in between, other than warriors, you and, and the drum, because what you're doing out there is actually drawing power from that, from that, uh, uh, from the drum, and also from the songs. Those, those songs are, are warrior songs. Uh, uh, they have been preserved in, uh, through time. And, and even in the words to those songs, there, there is power. There's medicine there. Medicine in the words and in the song. An avenue, perhaps, to begin the treatment of Indian Vietnam veterans. But not the only one, and certainly not some sort of magic. As with any victim of massive traumatic shock, there is a lot of hard work to be done. There are many resources available to assist in treatment of the Indian veterans. Because the sweat lodge takes care of three things that man is born with. That's the mental part of him, the physical part of him, and the spiritual part of him. And the biggest part of man is the spiritual part of him. So if you don't continue to fill that big void there, uh, you're going to be off balance. You have to get yourself back in balance, these three things back in balance. And that's what the sweat lodge does. Now, a lot of these uh, Indian veterans go to a VA hospital, so they need a doctor, or they need a psychologist, they need a doctor, a medical doctor for his body, and they need a, a minister or a priest for his spiritual part. But if you come in a sweat lodge, uh, that's all taken care of at once. All those three things that we're born with. And I think that's why a person comes in feeling bad and when he comes out, he's in balance there for a while. And what he needs to do is keep that balance. Don't let it get on balance again. Keep, keep that in balance and you're gonna be all right. There are a lot of guys, a lot of uh, street Indians and other Indians alike that uh, are walking around uh, confused and unable to define or, or explain that problem or explain what's wrong with them and it's insight and uh, they're 
they're really crying, and they and the only way they express this uh, is probably you know through alcoholism and anger, uh, physical abuse, and so forth upon themselves or the others, and. Uh, uh, It's uh, it's trying to reach these guys that come in, you know, to, into the vet centers, and trying to to let these guys know that they're not the Lone Ranger, and they're not alone out there. And these guys, uh, it's a system that they're so scared of and being not oriented to their needs, and uh, coming back and people not understanding what has happened and uh, uh, what they have been through is very hard on them, very hard. In some ways, if, if clinicians will outreach to Indian health agencies, it's a way of bringing Indians into, say, the vet centers or more into the VA system. The walls need to be broken down. The, the clinician needs to understand that an Indian is not an Indian is not an Indian, and so you have to have a whole myriad of, of resources to plug that person into and to be aware of. On reservations, um, BIA social services, BIA mental health things, Indian Health Service, or maybe the tribal health facilities, they've been too isolated and we haven't done the training in the area of post-traumatic stress with those mental health people that we really need to be doing. Those are other resources that the clinician can use. Uh, medicine people, both in urban settings and in on reservations, um, they have an immense store of knowledge that the clinician can draw on. But it's again, it's a seeking out and, and needing to know uh, what the resources are and when they're appropriate. And the best thing to do is to ask the veteran, you know, how do you feel about your culture? Are you involved in these kinds of things? Would this be useful to you? Are you aware that this is available? I consider myself as a warrior. Yes, it's something that gives me pride, honor, not that because I went to Vietnam and killed other people. I felt that, you know, this is something that I didn't want to do in the first place. I, I felt that I have served my country because my country has called up on me to serve in, a, in, in, in Vietnam. I felt that I have done my, my part and I felt that I, you know, I have gained it some honor out of that. I would say that from my experience with Vietnam, I would say that if there was ever another, I wouldn't want him to go through what I, what I went through, but it would be his choice. The experience in, in, in Vietnam was Probably one of the first times that I can say that I was scared. I know what fear is. I know what death is. One of the one of the as you grow older, one of the things that you are be better able to understand is the decisions that you make in your everyday life and to and to broaden your thinking and to take into consideration that warrior status to think for your family, your relatives, and your people for the better of them. If, the, if that sort of thinking puts you into a leadership role, then you can't deny it. The people aren't going to allow you to deny it because they'll put you there. Depending on how strict, how strict of a standard you set for yourself, with those values that you've gained, you know, any time you leave your area and you go to a foreign land, uh, you have, you have, you have where you've been exposed to dead bodies, or you have anything to do with death. You step on blood, you touch the enemies, and all this, and you must have a cleansing ceremony done. And I haven't had this, and uh, uh, in doing so, hopefully, I can become whole, uh, a whole person again, and both being from the non-Indian world and the Indian world and making myself uh, uh, one with nature again. Uh, I, I believe I'm out of tune and I'm gonna get myself back into tune. Uh, it's uh, 
my beliefs uh, are gradually changing towards it in ways, and hopefully in time I'll, I'll, do, I'll learn more about it. Uh, and be, one way would be to get this done for myself, uh, uh, to go through the traditional uh, healing ceremonies, you know, to uh, uh, get uh, all the bad spirits away from me. When I stopped drinking and found that I had to have a purpose in life, and then along comes my two children, that I had to put my feelings and a lot of uh, wants aside. The old warrior instinct came back. You know, I had to preserve the people. I had to preserve my family. And as a warrior in our people, your family or your people come first. You protect them. You do all you can for them. Your life is to be given for them. You live for them. And I've been taught that. And that comes first in my life is my family, my little ones, and my immediate my immediate family, and the rest of my my Indian people come in. But I take care of those that are around me, and I work for them, and I try to do things. So if I attain this degree, this master, that I'm able to to go on to really provide for them, and at the same time build up enough that I I'll be able to help others. You know. In the meantime, I try to work this war out of my system. Oh, 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 oh,